While Graham Sunas builds his football team, Chairman David Murray is masterminding the reconstruction of the main stand at Ibrox. When it's complete, it'll provide the last word in luxury for football fans. This structure alone will hold 24,000 people and will almost certainly have a use for major events outside of football. Expensive reconstruction on and off the park all costs money, and the fans who go to Ibrox are encouraged to take up deals which make their day out more enjoyable and at the same time make Rangers financially strong. Thousands of ordinary supporters have joined the Premier Club, which gives them access to an American-style concourse featuring everything you'd expect from the best fast food outlets. The only difference is that every product carries the Rangers crest. All this was created by Rangers commercial manager Bob Riley, welcomed here by ex-player Eric Caldo as he pays a pre-match visit to an area featuring hospitality on an altogether different level. Of the many corporate entertainment areas at Ibrox, this is the best. A world of champagne and gourmet food in which business is mixed with pleasure. Hundreds enjoy this five-star football package every week and there's no chance of anyone forgetting which team they're watching. Right, this is the, uh, the top level of corporate entertainment we have at Ibrox. Uh, 36 executive boxes, opened about a year ago, all sold. As you can see, there are brass, brass plates above each company's box. Each box holds eight, costs 25,000 pounds plus back uh, <laughs> per season. It's totally inclusive. Uh, by that I mean there are no, nothing extra. Uh, that money allows them to have a champagne reception on the rival, which they're having at the moment, in their box. They then have a five-course lunch uh, with red, white, red wine and white wine, uh, coffee and liqueurs. Normal half-time fair at football matches, including the pies. Uh, and at full-time, a free bar to six o'clock. This part, as you can see, uh, the boxes have sliding doors. This is to allow us to have a, a normal restaurant on non-match days. And we're delighted to say that uh, the restaurant is continually full. Uh, an interesting little fact is that in close season, uh, football grounds tend to be sort of uh, barren places. So we decided to keep the restaurant open last close season. And uh, the revenue from that was £100,000. So that's nice money. We can hear the uh, champagne corks popping in the background. How much champagne do we go through in here? We go through quite a lot. That's uh, on an average of 36 boxes. Uh, I would think there's probably about four, bo four bottles of champagne uh, in each box, uh, which is 160, say, 160 bottles of champagne. Uh, I think, what, there's 12, 12 in a case or something like that. Is it Rangers champagne? All Rangers champagne. Only Rangers champagne. Meanwhile, on the other side of the stadium, more guests arrive in the Thornton Suite, named after one of the Rangers' greats, Willie Thornton, who hosts a table. Another famous Ranger, John Gregg, has a new role as head of PR. Could you please welcome all the way from Bermuda to see today's game, Mr. Bill Story. I do feel Graham Souness has geared this club in particular for Europe. He's geared the club to say, if a European league comes around, and I'm sure that Graham Souness is convinced it's going to be sooner rather than later, I would say, sticking my neck out, by 1995 I'd be very, very amazed if there wasn't a European league in operation. And I think this club, he's saying, we're ready for it if the rest of Europe's ready for it. Obviously, obviously we'd like to do better in Europe. I feel um, in the past, through circumstances, suspensions and injuries, and us not playing well in the night, we've not done ourselves justice. Um, in Europe. Um, I'd want to do better in that field, obviously. Um, but actually winning the European Cup is an enormous, an enormous task for, for anyone to undertake. But we will try, and we'll try our hardest, and with a wee bit of luck, who knows one day. But it's not um, the be-all and the end-all. I want to, um, there's only one team coming to the European Cup every year. There's only one team won it in the last two years. And um, I just want to be part of building something here which um, I've never seen the likes of before in Scotland. Obviously this European dream is something which involves competing with clubs which you have explained uh, to the press and the media in general here to. are on a different level altogether. Yeah, well, we're, we're known as big spenders and by British terms and I suppose um, we have spent a lot of money. Um, in real terms we may have spent seven million. You know, we've had 
we've outlived a lot more than that, but we've got a lot back. Um, and the best example you could possibly give would be Juventus this year, who at the start of the season, the coach or manager, whatever you want to call him, was given, I think it was £45 million pounds to spend. Now I've spent £7 million pounds over five years on two or three different teams. That guy's been given £40 million, £45 million quid to spend on one team for one season. I think he only managed to spend 37 of it. So that's a measure of the opposition. Do you feel that... Uh... That's what you're up against, but it's not impossible. As I said, I'm an optimist, and every game I play, I think I can win. And that, 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 that comes down to the football in Europe as well. I think if given the right circumstances and given another two or three quality players at this club, the ones I've got, then we're capable of, of upsetting the best. Do you think the system of uh, club competition in Europe will change? I'd hope so. I would... Um, I think people's tastes are becoming more and more discerning. I think people only want to watch the best now, whether it's on BSB or whether it's live. And um, the Scottish public are no different, the British public are no different. To that. They'll want, they would want to see the big foreign clubs playing in our country on a regular basis. In a domestic sense, you have a very high profile. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. if it was part of a, a European organisation, you would be uh, maybe a, a, a smaller fish in a big pond. But here, I would you like are the that very much. You would like that. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, I feel that, and maybe even some of our own supporters are, are guilty of, of, of turning up and thinking because we've spent all this money that we've got divine right to go out and beat everyone in sight. Well, it's not like that. Life's not like that, and football's certainly not like that. Having said that, the Rangers manager has had to admit that the season so far has gone very much according to plan. It's try against Kidd, cutting away from the fullback. Good play by the Dutchman. And a goal for Rangers! 21 minutes gone here at Tynecastle. Marvellous play by Rangers. For oh, Johnston. Oh, great ball through Kelly McCoyce. He's onside. McCoyce must start. Number two for Rangers. Gets the header in. Oh, and a mistake there by Chris Woods, and the ball in the net. And George Wright has scored for Hearts with five minutes to go. Well, I can imagine Rangers manager Graham Souness will be seething at the loss of that goal. But here's a chance for Ali McCoy. And McCoy gets his second goal of the game. And number three for Rangers. Here's John Collins. Glancing header! Derek White for Celtic! Eight minutes into the second half, and Celtic have been under the cosh for so much of the game. Go ahead. Pass there from Walters to Stevens. Great close control. There's Mark Walters with the cross. Up goes Billy. It's a vital touch. McCoy's trying to win that from Joe Miller. It's back with Goff. Stephen chests it down to Harlock. Yes! Equaliser for Rangers. Terry Harlock's first goal for his new club. Great cross by Stephen. And Hastley scores! Hastley again doing well in the air. The Spackman forcing his way through with a chance to test Andy Gorham. Back it goes to Walters. Mark goes cross. Hastley again! Mark Hastley gets his second and his defence has Stephen and Haight and Walters over the ball. Sheer brilliance from Walters. A little touch on there from Haightley to find McCoy. Walters taking on Milne. Andy 
Robertson getting his first touch. It's John Brown again looking for the head of Hadley. A chance for Walters! Maybe Cooper starts his run, drives it forward. Boy scored! Well, the change in conditions now quite dramatic. The rain pouring down. Rangers pouring forward, it's Ali McCoy, Samo Johnston! A magnificent goal! John Brown, again looking for Haithley. Way by Angus, only as far as Spackman. Oh, great ball through now to Gary Stevens, he must start! Oh, brilliant goal by Gary Stevens! Maybe Cooper quickly closed down by Vinicom. Cooper, the chance, and they will pull one back. Rangers pouring out of the fence. McCoy and Johnson through the middle, so too is Gary Stevens. Gary Stevens! I, I think when you pay the amount of money that Graham pays for players, you don't really have to coach them too much, David. I think that's when you're paying over a million pounds for a player, you expect them to know the basics of the game, and they do. I think where Graham's problems are playing, is in convincing the fans. I mean, we all know Scottish football, it's up and at them. Let's get it in the box, get it forward. Graham's tried to adopt a European Liverpool-type game, if you like, where patience plays a big key in it. He's tried to get the fans to be patient. Let's build up from the back. I mean, he wants his players to all be able to pass the ball, to control the ball, to pass it through midfield, not just a big lump up the park. And I think that's been his biggest problem, is telling the fans and convincing them that that was the way forward for Rangers. But the players know it. He tells them every day, encourages them, Pass the ball, pass the ball. The training, very similar to Liverpool, I'm sure. I think everybody relates back to the Liverpool um, because they're such a good team. And, I mean, if you can go anywhere near um, you know, the playing abilities of them, then you won't be far wrong. I think the main thing in any football team is that, um, or that the manager tries to get over to us is that you've got to pass and move and keep doing it. And um, that's what we try to you know, put into the game. In a personal level, that profile that you have uh, has uh, got you into some trouble. Is it something that you troubles you, that worries you, or hurts you when, when you when no, you're disciplined? No, listen, I can, uh, I'm very fortunate. I've never suffered from jealousy in my life. And I can understand people being jealous or bitter or, or antagonistic towards me and this club if we're, if we're constantly in newspapers or we're constantly on television. I try, I consciously try not to, n not to be on television a great deal people say what am I doing this interview for. Um, I certainly try to avoid the newspapers as much as I can on the radio, but it's difficult. And when you do uh, get into trouble with, say, the SFA or whatever, it's because uh, of things where you... Got to watch what I'm saying here. Absolutely, but which is probably one of the reasons that you, you are so frustrated. But um, the passion that is part of this game, that everyone wants to be part of it, do you feel that you simply get caught up in that passion and that's sometimes what pushes you over the edge and causes you to be disciplined. I know about football, for the lifetime of football. I understand football. Um, people who hand out the discipline. And maybe I've not spent a lifetime in football, certainly not the sharp end. Um, I'm passionate about the game I'm involved in. If that sometimes leads me getting into trouble, then um, I can't change because that's the way I'm about the game. I love the game. I love every aspect of the game. And sometimes if people think I've fallen foul of the rules or their interpretation of the rules, then I'll have to just go along with that. Do you like being a winner? Um, it's not a case of, there's only one thing to be in life, David. And I think um, I've got a lot of winners down in the dressing room down there. They know how I feel about that. and. Um, I like to think a wee bit of me is rubbed off on them, and certainly with two of them in that dress room, some of their attitude to certain things is rubbed off on me. A heavy drizzle still falling here at Celtic Park. As Rangers enjoy in the early stages, the bulk of the possession. Here's a good move from Haitley. And calmly intercepted by the Polish international Dovchek. 
Jameis Basler, here's Robertson. Johnston calls for the ball. A stumble there from Johnston. And uh, likes Bailey stayed on his feet to take possession. A clumsy pass there from Bailey giving the throw. There's Boris Johnston! Opportunism at his best. Rangers are ahead. The Rangers Legion celebrate. And Morris Johnston, who could so easily have been playing for Celtic, scores for Rangers. Well, I think Rangers have been threatening this from the off -talk. They've been very positive in going forward. It's a misheader from Lex Bailey. So I'm not quite sure, but what about this for opportunism? That's finishing of the highest quality. Celtic heading back straight away. They want to call a kick. Here's Nicholas, playing it forward for Trainey. Well, that's a great goal from Trainey nearly. Oh, wonderful effort from Jerry Trainey. That must have been inches over the bar. The tackle came from Elliot. That's fine play by Grant. Trainey to Miller. Well, Celtic has certainly been stunned by that goal. Here's Charlie Nicholas. Superb goalkeeping. Trainee finds Nicholas, he's looking for a shooting chance. Back from Trainee. Trainee again. Well, what a promising partnership this is proving to be. All the big men are up. Celtic determined to equalise before half time. Here's John Collins. There goes Elliot. on replacing Morris Johnston. And here's Joe Miller. It's been a very interesting contest between Miller and Monroe. And here's Spikeman. The interception made by Collins. Here's Nicholas. Still Charlie Nicholas. And off the inside of the post. Charlie Nicholas wonders just what he has to do to score for Celtic. Well, the roof nearly came off Celtic Park there. But what a tremendous skill again from Nicholas. You people talk about as he got it. Look at that. And what a finish. It's a superb strike. Well, Celtic can either be saddened by that or lifted. And it looks as though they've been lifted. Well, that's great play again. Joe Miller. That's a corner kick, I think. Yes, the linesman's given it. Well, Celtic and this kind of mood looks to be irresistible. There's Collins looking for Fulton. It was caught there by Harlock. The referee waves play on as Fulton lies on the floor. The Celtic bench incensed by that as McCoy is in the clear. A chance for Rangers. 
Here's McCoy, he must score! Rangers take the lead! Harry McCoy scores his 12th goal of the season. And Celtic feeling very aggrieved about the fact that Mark Fulton is still on the ground inside the Rangers' half. Well, this is a tremendous blow for Celtic. There's no question of him being offside here, but what composure he shows. They've lost the top goal scorer. He makes Pat Bonner go on his backside, and he just rolls it into the empty net. That's a tremendous piece of finishing. Throughout Scotland, this is the typical meeting place where football is discussed on a daily basis. Everyone has an opinion, and no one is frightened to offer advice, even to the biggest names in the game. In Glasgow, most pubs tend to lean either one way or the other, and there's no doubt where the loyalties lie in this case. Rangers is the favourite topic of conversation here, and no one is spared from the punter's blunt views. Despite all the success, even Graham Souness has to take some stick from time to time. He's far too arrogant, too, too single-minded. He is arrogant, but when you've been there and done the business, you can afford to be arrogant. It's as simple as that. I think he's done exceptionally well at Rangers. I just cast my mind back five years before he came. They weren't doing very well at all. Mid of the, middle of the table, fourth, fifth in the league. Wasn't good enough for Rangers Football Club. And I think since he's came, they look as if they're going to win something every season now. They've got the best players, great set of fans. The place is buzzing every Saturday. I think it's been great for Scottish football. He's done a tremendous job over the last four or five years. Well, four years ever since he's came to Ibrox. He signed a Catholic. As far as I'm concerned, tremendous player. Right? He's done the job for Rangers Football Club, scored tremendous goals, and one of the best players out. And he had to buy him. It didn't bother me. I thought about it at the time, but I came out here, my mate, and we sat with Blether to come out and see the reaction of people. And obviously there was, there was a lot of people who were upset and didn't think it should happen. But to me, uh, he's a good striker. He puts the ball in the net, and he earned us some really valuable points last year. And that's what it's all about. It was a big deal, but we get used to it. Why was it a big deal for you? Because it was against everything that we've been brought up to believe Rangers was about. It's against the tradition of the club. I think he's a quality player, and I'm glad to sign him. I think if you just even watch him when he scored against Celtic, how happy he was. I think the players have accepted him. I think the fans have now as well. In the future, I'd just like to see Rangers go from strength to strength. I'd like to see them do well in Europe, but I still think they like that wee bit. In Europe, the nerve, and you see like, Italian teams, and I think Rangers are a good bat behind them just now. Anyway. I'd, like, I'd like to see them in the future going to be a, a force in Europe, but as I say, I think it'll be a few years from now. Anyway. I think now they're back in the right road, and uh, hopefully they'll go into maybe European glories. Well, I don't see it in the near future, possibly near five, ten years' time. Looking into the future, in ten years' time, what do you expect to be doing, and where will you be? Ten years time I'll have had the sack and I'll have been retired from football and hopefully spend a lot more time with my family. Do you seriously believe that that old truism about football, the only thing that's guaranteed is that a football manager will get the sack? Do you ever worry about it? Or do you feel it will definitely come true? Um, I'm a wee bit more comfortable about it now. I mean, as a player I was always looking over my shoulder who was going to replace me and as a manager I feel um, I could still fail. Um, I feel a wee bit happier the fact that I've won a couple of championships and a couple of trophies, so you know, and I won a few things as a player, so I wouldn't feel a total failure, no. I'm more comfortable, I can live with it, I'm more comfortable with it now, that thought, than I was the first day I walked in the door. So, so the success that you've had in management has uh, just recently led to you being linked to, for instance, the Real Madrid job, and uh, I do recall you saying that you couldn't afford the drop in salary, but. Uh, Seriously, how do you react when, when you are linked with jobs like that? That's, you know, the word exclusive seems to be used every day in certain newspapers and certain television programs. Um, they have no interest to in me. I'm, I've got a contract here. Um, I'm, I'm happy here. Um, I'm as happy as I've been in, in my footballing life, if you like. You know, I'm in charge of, basically, everything that goes on at the club in football terms. And um, I work with great people. I want to try and establish something here that, that um, I'll be lasting. You know that when my time comes for me to go, 
that I'll stand back and maybe be given another job somewhere within the club and say, well, I was partly responsible for creating whatever we've created. You know, to pass on um, a youth system that's second and to pass on a reserve team that's got players bursting to get into the first team and to pass on a really good first team that's capable of, of competing at the very highest level and be involved in creating the best stadium or one of the best stadiums in Europe, certainly the best stadium in Britain. I have no intention of leaving this place. I don't want to leave. And um, that short term, that's both in the year and a half of my contract that's left. And I thought to be signing a long term contract after that if the board sees fit.